In March 1995, the body of 41-year-old Julie Winningham was found just off Highway 14 in Washington in the USA's Pacific Northwest. She'd been strangled to death. He's a monster, six plus feet, 280 pounds. My mom was five pounds, 100 pounds soaking wet. So it was like a toothpick, you know, he's a big man. Julie had become the eighth victim of an active serial killer named Keith Jesperson. The 39-year-old truck driver had been murdering innocent women across America for the previous five years. In a sense, they were falling into the hands of a wolf, their hens in the hen coop, and Jesperson is the wolf at the door. Jesperson captured the intrigue of the nation when he confessed to five murders in an anonymous letter he sent to a newspaper, which he signed with a smile. I scrawled up that I killed Tanya Bennett in January 1990 and put down a circle with two eyes and a happy face. Keith Jesperson labeled the happy face killer had made his mark as one of the world's most evil killers. When 39-year-old trucker Keith Jesperson confessed all to detectives in March 1995, the media finally got a chance to put a name to the notorious Happy Face Killer. Over a five-year period, Jesperson squeezed the life out of at least eight women across five states. Detective Monty Butner was part of the investigative team that finally brought an end to the Happy Face Killer's reign of terror. Jesperson targeted typically prostitutes, homeless women, uh, women that he felt that would not have anybody that would report them missing anytime soon to give him a chance to escape to get out of the area driving his truck. Six foot seven inch Jesperson, a divorced father of three, towered over his diminutive victims. For Keith Jesperson, his big thing was control. He wanted to control women. He wanted to abuse them in the way that he was aroused by. So he focused on finding victims that he thought would meet that need for him. Despite his size and destructive power, Jesperson was mild-mannered and softly spoken during his confessions to detectives. Keith, for purposes of voice identification, would you please state your full name, please? My name is Keith Hunter Jesperson. And you understand this conversation is being recorded? Yes, I do. Is that with your permission? Yes, it is. Every time I talked to him, he was my best friend. And when you looked at him, the last thing you would ever suspect that this guy was a serial killer. I mean, he, he didn't hang around with bad people. I never heard him swear. Well, if you met Jesperson, the last thing you would suspect that he was a criminal. He doesn't come across as a criminal. At one point, he said to me, you know, you and I could go on a tour teaching people how not to get murdered. And that was kind of the mindset of this particular guy that he really enjoyed people looking at him and saying, oh my God, this is our serial killer. And, and he must be really a, an important, powerful person to, to be involved in that sort of a lifestyle. And so I don't think there was ever any remorse. It was, it was all about, I want people to look at me. This killer's story begins just outside of Vancouver, Canada. Keith Hunter Jesperson was born in Chilliwack, British Columbia, on the 6th of April, 1955. He grew up in a large family in a rural home. Jesperson had two brothers and two sisters. He was the so-called runt, I think, of the litter. The boy, I think, sought to get his father's attention from quite an early age. His father was incredibly domineering. His father really looked down on women. So from a very early age, he develops this view that a misogynistic view of women, a view of women that is, is quite demeaning, is one that's normal. Jesperson's assertive father appeared to bring out a violent side in the young man. One of Jesperson's earliest memories is apparently of throwing a rock down a slide at a children's playground that hit his brother in the head. 
And I think what he was trying to do here was essentially get his father's attention. His father was somebody who valued aggression, who valued this kind of behavior. And I think this really was a cry for that kind of validation from him. The ugly truth must be that he had no normality in his life. There was no convention in that family life and that upbringing, which meant that in a sense, there was no moral compass. There was no right and wrong. Before he'd even turned seven, Jesperson displayed traits that had become synonymous with serial killers. Jesperson liked to kill and torture animals, so he harmed cats and dogs and, and gophers and crows. That gave him a sense of, of power, a sense of control that he couldn't get in any other way. But he's also realizing that he quite enjoys having control over another living creature, of holding its life in your hands. The family moved south across the border into the US, and Jesperson would eventually find work in a job that would assist him in his murderous career. He's become a truck driver for a company in Washington State, which gives him access to freedom, drive around, can sleep in the cab, he can pull up with whatever truck stop he fancies, where they're almost always a collection of young women knowing that drivers want company. It's the perfect fit for Jesperson's character. So he's got a lot of time on his hands to, to ruminate, to, to fantasize, to start to plan things. So this is a, quite a dangerous situation to be in because nobody's there to put the brakes on his behavior. By early 1990, Keith Jesperson was separated from his wife and spending much of his time driving his truck up and down the seemingly endless highways of America. On the 22nd of January 1990, in Portland, Oregon, a 23-year-old woman was found dead. Tonya Bennett was reported missing by her mother, and some young man stopped along that highway one day and discovered her body, which had been drug off the road down into a little bit of a ravine off of the scenic highway out in the Columbia Gorge. Detectives presumed they'd solve the case quickly when a local woman, Laverne Pavilinek, told the police that her boyfriend was responsible for the death of Tanya Bennett. Laverne was several years older than John Sosnovsky, and John was an alcoholic, and I think John was probably a very abusive partner to Laverne. And I think she was just trying to get John Sosnowski out of her life and, and decided she would frame him for murder as a way to get John out of her life. In the beginning, she just tries to pin it completely on him. But then she, she kind of inserts herself into this narrative. And I think there's, there's almost a sense in which she's enjoying the drama of the story and she wants to play a larger part in it. Laverne's story was a lie. The police didn't know it yet, but Tanya had in fact been killed by a 34-year-old trucker named Keith Jesperson. He had met Tanya playing pool at the B&I Tavern, which was in East Multnomah County. And they had decided to go get something to eat at a nearby restaurant. and. When they left the tavern, he re realized he didn't have enough money with him to buy dinner. So he said, let's go to my house and I'll get some money. He gets involved in a sexual act with Tanya. And at that point, Tanya said something that offended him and he murdered her. He choked her um, with his fist and he was a big man. Tanya was a little woman, and so there wasn't a big challenge to kill Tanya. And I don't think he cared very much. I mean, he left her in the house and to cover his tracks, went back to the bar and had another series of drinks and then went back to the house and decided he's going to dump the body. Well, he's got plenty of opportunities to dump the body. All he needs to do is to load her into the truck and he can drop her where he wants. Tanya Bennett had become Jesperson's first victim. And despite the fact that two other people were in court charged with the 23-year-old's murder, Jesperson had an urge to tell the world that he was her killer. While the trial's taking place, 
he stops off in a restroom and writes a message on the wall, which is, I beat her, I raped her, I killed her. I liked it. You may think I'm sick, but I enjoyed it. And two other people are taking the fall. And he signs it with a smiley face. And at first, this would appear to be quite compelling, but it wasn't new information. It was information that anybody could have heard and just repeated onto the wall. So I think this was a desire for recognition on Jesperson's part. It was a desire to be noticed and to actually take the credit for these murders. As news of the truck stop confession reached Laverne Pavilinek and John Sosnovsky's lawyers, they were intrigued. But the jury would never get to hear about the revelation signed with a smiley face. The defence of Laverne and John try to get these confessions brought in as evidence in the trial, but the judge forbids it. It's hearsay, it could be anybody, it's not convincing, there's no forensic proof. Sorry, we're not allowing it into evidence. And both are duly convicted of the murder. And Keith Jesperson is free to kill again. After all, he's already boasted that he can, so why shouldn't he? As two innocent people were sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Tanya Bennett, Keith Jesperson remained free. In 1992, two years after killing for the first time, Jesperson struck again, this time in California. Jesperson's second victim, Claudia, was a woman who he kept alive in his truck for four days. He quite enjoyed torturing her. He quite enjoyed the fact that she would have been fearful for her life and probably pleading for her life. So this really highlights that it's the process that Jesperson enjoys. It's that feeling of power, that feeling of complete control and domination he gets when he has got somebody who's completely subservient to him. He eventually, after a few days, gets bored, kills her by punching her literally to death and then chucks her out of the truck. Now, how do you identify the body of a young woman found miles away from where she may or may have been last seen? We remember we're in the early 90s here. We don't have the kind of elaborate databases that the police authorities have now. It's simply a body. And again, that confirms to Jesperson his ability to get away with it his ability to do what he wants. It's a very powerful, addictive substance for a man who's already got a warped mind and has no moral compass. This is powerful medicine indeed. By April 1994, Jesperson had killed another three women, taking his gruesome tally to five. But the 39-year-old was growing frustrated with the lack of credit he felt he deserved for his ongoing killing spree. He began to right that wrong by sending letters to an Oregon courthouse and a local newspaper, reiterating his claims that he was the person responsible for the death of Tanya Bennett back in January 1990. Keith loves the media attention. He was doing anything he could to obtain that attention. And when somebody else was getting it, uh, Keith wasn't comfortable with that. So when that occurred was the first time Keith came out of um, hiding, so to speak, contacted the newspaper, took credit for the homicide of Tanya Bennett, but would not divulge who he was. With all of the letters, he signed them with a happy face at the bottom, and the Oregonian newspaper deemed him the happy face killer. At this point, he's really, really frustrated. He's written on the walls of truck stops. He's written to the county court, and yet still, he's not getting the recognition that he feels he deserves, especially around that smiley face moniker that he's crafted. He probably thought that was a brilliant kind of brand identity, and nobody's picking it up. So at this point, he's really, really angry. He's screaming out now, I've done this. I'm proud of this. I deserve recognition for it. The letters detailed all five of the murders that Jesperson had committed, allowing authorities to link these separate cases together. But the trucker continued on regardless. 
He killed a sixth victim, known only as Suzanne, in September 1994. And in January 1995, he claimed a seventh, his most inhumane so far. Angela Sabrice is one that always sticks in my mind because it doesn't start out at a truck stop in the same way as the many of the other killings had. This time, he offers Angela a lift. She's 21, she wants to lift to see her father. In the end, she phones her father, and her father says, oh, don't come now. So she decides to go and see her boyfriend in Indiana. According to Jasperson, he got irritated with her because she was telling him to hurry up. He says how much she was nagging at him and how much she was bitching at him. And what he's doing here is, is victim blaming. He's drawing on these stereotypical notions of women as annoying, as nagging, because that has often been used in the past to justify murders. It's this kind of crime of passion type of argument. And he really is quite in tune with that. After spending a week together on the road, Jesperson strangled Angela to death, but he was far from finished with her. You have a man who is now quite literally out of control. But what makes Angela's killing so horrible is that he decides to cover his tracks and he ties the poor dead young woman's body under his truck and tows it. And the objective is to obliterate her face and her fingerprints. He's sufficiently aware that he knows that this one could be traced. After all, one or two people well, may well have known that he had offered her a lift. And he wants to make sure that uh, she's unidentifiable. This is a killing of the supreme wickedness. I mean, one feels desperately that she couldn't possibly have deserved that horrific fate. And yet, Jesperson meted it out to her without a twinge of conscience, as far as we can see. The pace of Jesperson's killing spree was accelerating. And just two months after the murder of Angela Sabrise, in March 1995, a body was discovered in Washington, just off Highway 14. Uh, I'm at the Washougal Police Department, and uh, I need to see an officer. I think I found a body alongside the road. OK, why do you think it's a body? Well, because I, I was at the side of the road, and I was urinating, and I saw it down on the hillside. It looks like a female. I can see a hand with fingernail polish. I was actually on days off, and it was, I believe, March 11th, 1995, when I received a call at home stating that they had received a report of a body that was found near the county line just into Skamania County. The patrol officers were responding at that time, and they asked that I respond as well. I went off the bushes there, and I looked down the hill, and it looked like I thought it was a mannequin at first, and I, I saw the fingernail polish. I went down and got kind of close, but then I got kind of sick. The only thing really in that area between the highway and the river is a set of railroad tracks that was all the way at the lower edge of that. Um, but, but just over the bank, probably 20 feet down over the edge from the highway, is where the body was located. This latest case bared all the hallmarks of the notorious Happy Face Killer. When we look at the locations in which Jasperson dumped the bodies, and you look at the other types of item that you find in that location, it's trash, it's rubbish, it's discarded things that people no longer want. And that is exactly how Jasperson sees his victims. He's had his fun with them, they've served their purpose, and now he's just gonna dispose of them. It appeared to me that she had not been there very long, uh, between possibly 24 and, and 36 hours. She was laying on her right side, and her face was facing the ground. I could see evidence that's either consistent with uh, strangulation or lividity, because she was basically inverted. Her head was lower than the rest of her body. Um, once the heart stops, blood will pool at its lowest point. And in this case, it would have been her upper torso, neck, and face. One of the things that uh, became a hallmark of uh, Jesperson's uh, killing was the punched his victims repeatedly in the neck and face and in the throat, thereby eventually killing them. He was a puncher, beat them literally to death. 
The first task for the investigating team was identifying the body. We had no clothing, we had no uh, purse, no wallet, uh, no way to identify her. So one of the things that we do at the medical examiner's office is we take fingerprints from the victim. Um, we then run those through the automated fingerprint identification system, known as AFIS. And in this case, the victim, Julie Winningham, her fingerprints were in the AFIS system. 41-year-old Julie Winningham had become the latest woman to be killed at the hands of the Happy Face Killer. Jesperson is a man who feels completely entitled to treat women in this way. He picks up women in his truck. He thinks, I have a right to do with these women whatever I want. Now, he knows that what he's doing is wrong, but, but that doesn't stop him because he feels that he has some God-given right to do this. In a sense, they were falling into the hands of a wolf. Their hens in the hen coop, and Jesperson is the wolf at the door. But Jesperson's world was about to come crashing down around him. The 39-year-old serial killer had made a mistake that would lead the police to his door. Julie Winningham had become Keith Jesperson's eighth victim, but she would also be his last. Julie's son, Don Finley, was 24 at the time. My mom, she was a cheerful, free spirit, caring and loving. She was just a traveler and a, an adventurer and was a free soul and didn't understand that when I was young. But as I grew up, I grasped what it was all and why she chose her life the way she did. Julie and Don did not have a traditional mother-son relationship. Don was working in California while Julie moved between the Pacific Northwest. There was a time when I came up here in 91, the last time I physically saw my mom. We drove around, we talked, we got caught up. And in 95, my mom had called me February 12th, which was her birthday. And my birthday was February 20th. She told me she was up in Idaho with a friend and planning on coming down to Washington. By March 1995, Julie was spending a lot of time with some friends in the Portland area, just on the Oregon side of the Columbia River. She started hanging out at some of the, the truck stops. Um, Burns Brothers over in Troutdale uh, had a dance floor and quite the nightlife. A lot of people would go over there whether they drove trucks or not. And I believe it was a country and western bar and they would uh, just hang out and have drinks with friends over there. So she got into that circle over there as well. After Julie's body was found just across the river in Washington, her son Don was given the devastating news. I was at work and I received a phone call from my aunt telling me that they had found my mom dead on the side of Highway 14, murdered and raped. I lost it. I uh, punched fences. I pulled off paper towel rolls, walked down the street and just collapsed in the middle of the street, no one around. Friends, didn't, the people I knew as friends didn't know what to think. Detectives interviewed Julie's friends and they immediately had a lead. She had a boyfriend who was a truck driver. Speaking with Julie's friends, we were very interested in who this truck driver was that she was with. Unfortunately, her friends really didn't pay much attention to him. Um, they noticed that he drove a big blue truck, a semi-truck with a sleeper cab, but they weren't sure of his name. Some of them said his name maybe was Keith. Some of them said his name was Chris. They were just unsure. Just as it seemed the trail was going cold, investigators got their biggest break yet. Fortunately, one of Julie's friends had just bought a car from Julie. And out of that transaction of buying the car, Keith was there and was asked to sign the bill of sale as a witness. So the friend gave us the bill of sale, and on a, as a witness, it said Keith Hunter Jesperson. So that was our first indication of who we were looking for. For the first time since his killing spree began, the name Keith Jesperson was with the detectives. 
the 39-year-old had made an uncharacteristic error. There's all sorts of footprints that have been left in the sand that lead you directly back to Keith Jesperson. He makes the mistake of killing someone who has got a past, would have a future, and has got a whole network of friends to prove it. It's a gigantic miscalculation, but the reason he miscalculates is by now he is simply addicted to killing. He oversteps the mark. He goes too far because he can't stop himself. And I think that's testament to his arrogance uh, at this point in his, his serial murders. He, he really does think he's untouchable, that he's not going to get caught. Detectives trace Jesperson via his employers to a job over a 1,000 miles away from Washington. Keith Jesperson was told that when he dropped off his load in Hurley, that he was to travel to uh, the Las Cruces, New Mexico fairgrounds, county fairgrounds, to pick up a load of steel at that point. That was fabricated to the point to where we could basically bring Keith Jesperson to us and uh, him thinking that it was another pickup point. It was actually us waiting for his arrival. Monty remembers his first encounter with the imposing killer. Keith Jesperson is a very big man. However, he is somewhat soft-spoken, so it's almost like he's, he's using that to, to make people feel comfortable around him. And my first impression was using the way he was speaking to us and the soft tones, even though he's a very big man, I could see where he could pick a, a, a victim up and they would feel somewhat safe being with him until he changed unexpectedly. So that was my first impression, that, that this man could easily victimize some women. Jesperson claimed that Julie was still alive when he last saw her. Without any physical or forensic evidence, the detectives were powerless to arrest him. They flew back to Washington to continue their investigation into the death of Julie Winningham. I saw my mom for the very last time in a white room on a silver slab with a white sheet up to her neck with a black and blue mark across her whole face, shrub marks on her cheeks, and that was the last time I physically saw him. No sooner had the detectives touched down in Washington, Jesperson had a sudden change of heart. Maybe at this point, Jesperson realizes that really the game is up and there's nothing he can do. So he confesses to his employer, the truck company, that he's going to confess to the police. And he himself leaves a voicemail for one of the detectives who's come to interview him. This is Keith Jesperson. I'd like to talk to you. I'll be in Phoenix in the morning. And you were right. I have, uh, I've been fighting with myself for the last two days. Tried to kill myself a couple times, and it hasn't worked. Not a damn pill in this damn country. I'll talk to you in the morning. Bye. March 23, 10, 38. PM. To save this message, press 1. Yes, Keith. I am in Arizona. I'll call you when you're there, I guess. I don't want to turn myself in, so I'll talk to you later. Bye. Detective Rick Buckner spoke to Jesperson on the phone when the killer reached a truck stop in Arizona. Okay, Keith, tell me what happened. Where are you at right now? Julie then was angry because of the car that she recently sold to the friend because Keith Jesperson signed it as a uh, witness. She wanted the car back and she blamed Keith because 
she couldn't get the car back because of the bill of sale that he had witnessed. He said that they got into an argument about that. What'd you do at that point? Huh? What'd you do then? I just grabbed her by her throat and pushed her down into the bike. He held his hands around her neck or his fist on her throat and held her down. At that interview, on the phone interview, he said as long as five minutes. In later interviews, he thought it was as long as 10 minutes that he held his fist or hand over her neck, um, strangling her until she stopped moving. So at our request, Cochise County Sheriff's Office sent deputies out, and they arrested him at the truck stop where he had made the call to call Detective Buckner. Keith Jesperson was finally in custody, but the police were only just beginning to realize they'd captured the notorious Happy Face Killer. In a letter to his brother sent just before his arrest, Jesperson had outlined his crimes, writing, I am sorry that I turned out this way. I've been killing for five years and have killed eight people, assaulted more. I guess I haven't learned anything. By the time that we had knowledge of those letters, the investigation at Julie Winningham was in its final stages. And so at that point in time, the letters to his brother that was reviewed, the letters to the Oregonian that were reviewed, it was, it was believed at that time that, yes, we indeed possibly had multiple victims in this case of Keith Jesperson. It was time to sit down with Keith Jesperson and find out exactly what the happy face killer had to say for himself. I didn't feel like I had control of what I was doing. I felt like I was sitting back watching. I just couldn't believe I did it. From the letters and interviews with Jesperson, detectives learned that he'd killed eight women across the USA, from the very northwest in Washington all the way down to the southeast in Florida. Investigators were determined to put names and faces to some of the unknown women that Jesperson had claimed to have murdered. Gradually, the police put together a picture of the victims and where they are. They begin to find, or at least identify, some of the bodies, which are in five states, so it's not an easy task. In a letter he sent to the Oregonian newspaper a year before his arrest, Jesperson had claimed to have killed a woman before dumping her body in Salem, Oregon. This alerted Marion County DA Mark Mackler when he heard that the happy face killer had been apprehended. His hands were very large. When I met him and interviewed him and saw him for the first time in the Clark County Jail in Vancouver, Washington, he had to duck when he walked through doors because um, he had that kind of size. I mean, he was a big guy. And he didn't present himself with that size as a monster so much as somebody who probably looked like a big, giant, friendly guy until enraged, I suppose. Mark was able to get a blood sample from Jesperson, which revealed a DNA match to semen found on the body of Laurie Pentland, who'd been the killer's fourth victim in November 1992. Laurie Pentland was choked to death, and what we understood was whether he intended to kill her or not, whether he intended that she was the next victim or not, what we understood was that she was engaged in a sex act with him, an oral sex act with him. I think it probably got violent with him a little bit, and she bit him, and he killed her. That's what we understood. Jesperson had employed his usual MO of squeezing the life out of Laurie Pentland's body. Jesperson killed Laurie by a process of stop-start strangulation. So he would throttle her until she almost went unconscious, and then he would kind of back off, and, and she would come round again, and then he would start that process 
over again. So I think this is part of the murder that Jesperson really enjoys, this holding somebody else's life in his hands. It's something that he wants to prolong, it's something that he wants to amplify. So this must have been incredibly terrifying for his victim. When a victim is choked, typically bones in the neck are broken. Remember I told you he had massive hands, so he crushed her neck. I mean, he, that, that's effectively what happened. Jesperson was charged with the murder of Lolly Pentland, and after telling detectives where they would find her mutilated body, the 40-year-old was charged with a third murder, that of Angela Sabraiz, the woman he dragged under his truck in January 1995. As his confessions continued, he once again claimed to be responsible for killing Tanya Bennett in January 1990 a crime for which two people had already been convicted. OK, at some point, did you meet a female that you were killed? Yes, I did. I met a, a gal that's, uh, I can't remember exactly, it's the 20th or the 21st of the month. It's been such a long time ago. Of uh, what month? Of January 1990. You mean, you know what her name was? I found out it was Tanya Bennett. Jesperson told detectives that Tanya had come back to his home after the pair had met in a bar and been for a meal. They soon began having sex on a mattress on the floor. And uh, she made a comment to uh, when I was over the top for her, uh, something like, well, I'm not getting there once you hurry up and get it over with, kind of like, I pissed, like that pissed me off. I uh, tagged her with my right arm. What do you mean by you tagged her with your right arm? What does that mean? I just lost my cool, and I, I struck her in the side of the face, and I never stopped striking her until she was laying there. I took my right fist and put it into her Adam's apple and shoved down until she was dead. Where okay. I felt she was dead, I just heard gurgling noises and that. She probably died at the time I put my fist in her throat. Jesperson described the brutal murder, the first one he committed, in a calm manner. The Washington detectives contacted their colleagues across the Oregon state border. One day I got a call from Rick Buckner, who was a Clark County detective. And Rick said, we've got an inmate in custody in Clark County for, for killing his girlfriend. And he is telling us and he's telling his fellow inmates that he murdered a woman named Tanya Bennett. Of course, detectives didn't believe him because we have two people in prison already, one of which confessed to it. However, Keith Jesperson asked if we located Tanya Bennett's purse and identification card, which wasn't located at the location where her body was. He indicated that he dumped that at a different location and he was willing to show us where that was. Jesperson described throwing the evidence into a blackberry field the morning after he'd murdered Tanya. I look down off the side, and nobody's around. I take the person's contents and throw it down off over the bank. I figure I threw the purse probably 40 feet. If, uh, if I could get you out of jail, would you take me and show me where you dumped it? Yes, I would. We took him to the crime scene or the dump site out in the Columbia Gorge, and he said that he left her body but took the purse with him. He said, I threw the contents of her purse in this area. Well, it was a big area, and it was the blackberries were 10 feet high. After a thorough search of the vast area by police and the local scouts, they failed to find any evidence. But the detectives refused to give up the ghost. My partner, Jim McNally, said, maybe we ought to do it one more time. So the next Saturday, we sent the Explorer Scouts out again with the police supervisor, and they found Tanya's ID card, her Oregon-issued ID card, and it was as good a condition as it was the day it was thrown there. Well, only a person who threw it there could have pinpointed that precise location within, within I guess, 100 yards of where we found it. but. So that was, that was the turning point, and that was the point where, where I felt we could charge Jesperson with a crime because we had enough evidence 
to implicate him in the crime, and we wanted more than his confession, and the, the, the ID card turned out to be that one piece that we needed. Anything else you want to tell us? We, that we didn't ask, so we, we should ask, ask, you. ask you something. I'm sorry, Dad. Yeah. Uh, this is why I've been sorry a long time. Just three weeks after the ID card was uncovered, on the 2nd of November 1995, Keith Jesperson entered a no contest plea for the murder of Tanya Bennett. He was given a life sentence. Less than a month later, Laverne Pavelinak and John Sovnovsky were freed from prison. Jesperson, had he not wanted to talk about it, would probably never would have been convicted. There was virtually no uh, forensic evidence left at the crime scene. So had Jesperson not come forward, there's a good chance that uh, the two people who went to prison would still be in prison. On the 15th of November, 1995, Jesperson was given another life sentence for the murder of Laurie Pentland. And in December, Jesperson was back in court for a third time, this time charged with the murder of Julie Winningham, the girl whose death had led to the downfall of the happy face killer. I attended every day front row. What he said in court was he had raped my mother, he had duct taped my mother, stuck his fist down her throat to make sure she was dead, he kept her in the cab of his truck for 12 to 24 hours and drove her up and threw her off the side of the gorge like a piece of garbage. And I had to hear this man say that in court. This monster's telling me what he did. Once again, Jesperson was found guilty, his third life sentence. He was sentenced to two consecutive life terms in Oregon and a consecutive life term in Washington, and it, it effectively three lives, back to back to back. So he's going to die in prison. He took a kind, caring, loving, free-spirited mother, aunt, sister, daughter, soul from this planet for his enjoyment. And the impact it's left is almost unreal, but I had to face it because it was my mom, not nobody else's mom. In 1998, Jesperson was found guilty once more for the murder of Angela Surprise. And in 2007 and 2010, he was convicted of two murders in California between 1992 and 1993. In total, the outspoken killer has been convicted six times. He remains in prison in Oregon. I've arrested a lot of people for a lot of crimes and a fair number of murders, and this is the only one that I ever arrested that seemed to be awful pleased with his accomplishments. Keith Jesperson is a very evil person. He looks for people's weaknesses, he looks for women's weaknesses, and then exploits those to get everything he can possibly get from them, and then he kills them and discards them when he's done. He is the epitome of evil. Jesperson was an imposing figure who used his huge fists to either beat his victims to death or strangle the life out of them. For five years, he managed to evade justice until the same hands he used to kill signed a document that led detectives right to his door wiping the smile off the happy face of Keith Jesperson, one of the world's most evil killers.